Exactly. It's our work to do this. Um, actually, I was taking a walk with my regular walking partner who's had a grandson who was, who was adopted from Ethiopia. And I said to her, I had never, I never saw before BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, and I had no idea what it was, so I had to look it up. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, it's black and indigenous people of color. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, that doesn't make sense because what's black? And I said, African-American. And she said, but my grandson is from Ethiopia and he's black. And I don't think that's what they mean. I think in BIPOC they mean African-Americans. And yeah. we had yeah. this whole dialogue about it. I mean, there's so much to learn. It is. The subtlety is there. Is it that they were born in Ethiopia and not born in America through like um, through like a, a lineage of slavery? Is that the yes? Is, okay. Yes. This is an important point, and I'm so glad you brought it up because, um, and of course, our our subject today is white privilege, which is really all about our our ignorance and how much we haven't been exposed to, and how much we are are having to catch up and learn these things. Um, actually, it was an interview with. Ibram X. Kindi, where he was saying, you know, the preferred term is black because you might have very dark skin, but maybe you're from like um, the India. India or Haiti or someplace that has nothing to do with Africa. Maybe you are an immigrant who is not American. And so to call uh, anyone with dark skin black, uh, black is more respectful of just like the, the terms we've invented really. Um, rather than assuming this whole lineage of, you know, that background, which is its own specific culture, which is very different than other cultures. Um, so is he saying that, hi, hi, is he saying that someone, let's say from Ethiopia, should be called black? Yes. 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 All right, so I'm going to do more research because BIPOC, says black and indigenous people of color and i thought they meant african-american black so, so i think I that black is the umbrella and under that umbrella are many different varieties of black people black culture um right, but then why say indigenous people because they can be I black think, also i think i read that differently judith i read it as a comma black comma indigenous exactly. comma and and people of color. That's that's the hmm. difference. Of indigenous people. We're talking Native American. Yeah, it's not how I. I'm going to do more research. Thank you, Carol, because that's not when I looked it up. That wasn't how the two definitions I looked up. Uh, oh, okay, well, I I'm gonna, no, I'm going to research. That's good to know. And post what you learn in the group because I will. That's I will. our. I'm not like, averse to posting, together. as you know. <laughs> oh, we know. Um, welcome, Patty. Good to have you here. We've got a couple new faces, which is exciting. Sorry for being late. No worries. Mind and body. We have to take care of both. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So let's go ahead and dive in to our art class, anti-racist art class for today. And our theme or subject that we're going to be diving into is white privilege. So um, I am gonna share my screen for a minute because I wanna show you where you can find the resources that I'm going to uh, be discussing today and where you can actually um, follow along with the art lesson. So here we are at school.jessicaantonelli.com. Some of you use the app and I'm just clicking one of the featured like um, shortcuts to get to our class, the anti-racist art classes. Uh, and here we are in the table of contents. So I went ahead and added under the section that says art classes and anti-racist resources, um, our lesson from today. So we are going to be talking about the invisible knapsack of white privilege. Have any of y'all heard of this before? The invisible oh. knapsack of white privilege? Oh. No? All right. No. So, this is um, an essay that was written in 1989 by a feminist scholar, American feminist scholar, Peggy McIntosh. And she uh, wrote this beautiful um, unpacking of what it really is and means to have and to hold white privilege. Because as a feminist scholar, she was able to recognize that there is a huge parallel 
between what she had been studying as a scholar, male privilege, and the differences between what it's like to be um, a man and a woman out there in the world uh, versus being a person of color and a white person. And, and she started to say, oh, okay, well, all of this stuff that we've been um, considering as like male privilege, and let me go ahead and you can click right here when you get to this in the course to see the essay. Um, so, I'm going to actually read this straight from the essay, and you can read the whole thing. I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, check this out. And we're actually, the lesson that we're going to do today is we're going to draw our knapsack. And I'll be taking you step by step through how to draw the, the backpack or the knapsack of privilege. And then we are going to be texting, writing in around our knapsack, unpacking our experience privileges. But here's a quote. I think whites are carefully taught not to recognize white privilege as males are taught not to recognize male privilege. So I have begun in an untutored way to ask what it is like to have white privilege. I've come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. Describing white privilege makes one newly accountable. And I know that's what we're all here for. So she really, it's, it's a beautiful essay um, where she says, you know, there's a corollary to recognizing that there's, there's a group Maybe it's, it's women, um, maybe it's people of color who are struggling, who, are, who have been placed at a disadvantage because of the system. And that corollary is that you, as the person who holds the privilege, um, you're, you're experiencing these unearned things you're probably not even aware of. And how can, how can you, first of all, recognize it? And then secondly, like begin to hopefully release those, um, those privileges in order to reach equality, at the very least be aware of them. So I'm going to go through some of these. We won't go through each and every one. There are 50, but she just uh, started to unpack what she recognized was her own um, white privilege. So I'm going to bounce through a whole bunch of these. And in just a minute, we are going to draw our backpacks. Now, um, yeah, let me just get started or any thoughts before I start um, reading through these. Okay, cool. So number one, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Two, I can avoid spending time with people whom I was trained to mistrust and who have learned to mistrust my kind or me. Three, if I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in, in an area which I can afford and in which I would want to live. Four, I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. Five, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. Six, I can turn on the television or open the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. Seven, when I am told about our national heritage or civilization, I am shown that my people or that people of my color made it what it is. Eight, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. Nine, if I want to, I can be pretty sure of finding a publisher for this piece on white privilege. I'm just gonna skip ahead um, and bounce around through a bunch of these. Number 14, I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. I can be pretty sure that my children's teachers and employers will tolerate them if they fit school and workplace norms. My chief worries about them do not concern other attitudes, others' attitudes about their race. Um, bouncing down. Um, I can be pretty sure that if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I will be facing a person of my race. If a traffic 
cop pulls me over or the IRS audits my tax return, I can be sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. Um, if I declare that there is a racial issue at hand or there isn't a racial issue at hand, my race will lend me more credibility for either position than a person of color will have. I can worry about racism without being seen as self-interested or self-seeking. I can be sure that if I need legal or medical help that my race will not be used, uh, will not work against me. I can choose blemish cover or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. I mean, it goes on and on. As you can see, these are just the top 50 things that popped into her mind. And you can, uh, as I mentioned, download this on in our website. Um, but before we start drawing, I'm curious if any privileges uh, of the ones I just mentioned or ones that we haven't talked about, if you're aware of any privileges or if, if you can think of a specific experience where you experienced white privilege or light skin privilege working for you. Yeah, Zach. Um, in the classical world, um, I think that there is an inherent um, receptiveness to the, the white pipeline of, of composers. Um, there's just so many, like it's in the Euro white European tradition. Um, and I actually kind of have come up against this in my, um, in my string quartet, um, where there is, instead of having like a, a receptive attitude to any and all music, there's this good music mm, standard that I think is a little too, I don't, whitewash might be the... Like might, Eurocentric maybe? Yeah. And it doesn't really, um, I don't know, it, there's a, uh, how do I say, there's, there's more of a receptiveness to the Eurocentric um, ideal or conception of classical music as opposed to a, um, let's say like, a, like a, a black or a, any other real voicing of classical music. And so that's been, um, that's been interesting and kind of difficult to work up against. Can I make a request? Yeah. Um, I know, so we were talking before y'all hopped on the call about some of the different things um, like Judith and Carol have been researching in their uh, anti-racist work. And I know, Zach, you've been listening to some African um, written, African composers of classical work. And, uh, it, and as much as, I think it was a black composer. Or a black it? composer? Okay, cool. Would you post that? Because the sound is amazing. And I would love for everybody to get to listen to that in the group. And um, be right back. It is different. Oh, he's right. He's on it. Um, cool. Judith, yeah. So I was raised in a development in Manhattan called Peter Cooper Stuyvesant Town. It's a huge um, 14 story red brick buildings. Um, my mother moved into the second building. Her best friend moved into the first building. Her best friend had a daughter a year before me, and we are best friends. Aww. And Claire called me before we started this class, you know, like three weeks ago, and said, I just read an article by James Baldwin that says where we were raised had a no black policy, mm. a printed no blacks allowed policy. She said to me, were you aware of that? Now, I lived there until I was 16. She lived there until she was 13. I said, I had no awareness. No, I didn't. She said, do you think our parents did? Did they ever talk to you about it? I said, never talked to me about it, and I don't know that, I, I don't know that they were aware. So I did research, which is my want, and there was an article from 2006 in the New York Times, a long article by the granddaughter of one of the 20, 35 families that supported the first black couple to move in when they were, they were visiting. So they weren't paying and MetLife who owned this development tried to get them out. And then the 35 families, they tried to have them thrown out also. And so we've been, we've been studying this and talking back and forth, you know, the people that I grew up with and it just amazed me that there was just no, I mean, it was like, 
no awareness whatsoever. It's that behind the scenes stuff that if you're just going about your day to day, I mean, we're all busy enough and that kind of thing you just miss out on. And then yeah. what I'm learning from the um, how to be an anti-racist is it goes back to looking for policies, explaining why things look the way they do by digging deep, doing that research and figuring out, oh, somebody made a rule that said these um, that black people couldn't live here. Whereas um, if you are in a racist mindset or if you just don't know any better, then you would look around and blame the people. Say, oh, well, they didn't work hard enough to make enough money to live in this neighborhood. So that's their uh, problem. It's not our problem when they just don't know what, what really happened. I was interested when you said invisible equals mean, uh, meant to be oblivious because that's exactly mm -hmm. what was going on. Yeah, Carol. Judith, um, what year did you say this challenge came? Uh, so in 19, the, the first buildings were built in 1948, and this first black couple with their daughter moved in as guests in 52. And I can send you the article. It's fascinating how they, oh, that was quick, Zach. Um, that, uh, it was just fa the whole story is fascinating. It was like reading a novel. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I heard something about that on NPR um, recently too, that that is all over, especially in the South, and they're still trying to um, go back and either change those if they're still on paper, or um, yeah, um, the, the problem is even if you take, the, take it off the paper, you still have everybody living basically, all the segregation um, continues, and so well, I, I take uh, two women out who are in their mid-90s who have lived there their whole, you know, most of their lives. Mm -hmm. And one of them, when I had this conversation with her, I said, when you moved in, and she moved in in 58, so already this had been challenged. She said, um, when I wanted to move in, she's white, um, they wanted to come and see where I lived. And I thought it was to see if I was neat. I said, probably it was to see if you were black. It never occurred to her, but that's probably true. Yeah. She said in her building since 1958 to now, there's been one family of, of color. Mm, wow. That, um, that just brings a whole nother long conversation that we might have to turn into another anti-racist art class because uh, land ownership and Home ownership is one of the biggest manifestations of the way that black people have been disenfranchised and actively, um, yeah, held down. So, Ellie, please. Um, I think one recent form of privilege is being able to wear a mask outside for protection of COVID, and black people tend to get, pro uh, what's the word, um, profile more for that. So that's really scary because that is a big safety measure. We need to wear a mask when going outside to protect ourselves and others, but that can also be dangerous. That's a, mo a more recent example. Mm. Oh, Ellie, I'm so glad you said that because I, I noticed, I discussed that I have a walking partner, and we noticed that we were conscious. Of, so we're, we, we, we wear a mask, we distance. But if there are two people coming towards us that don't have masks, we walk either into the street or around. We, we distance because they're not conscious, I felt. And then we were walking towards two African-American men who had their masks on their necks. And so we walked into the street and I said to her, I wonder if they think we did that because they were black or because they weren't wearing masks. Were they even thinking that they weren't wearing masks because they obviously didn't care enough? And I wondered if they thought we were scared of them because they were big black men or something. That's yeah. tough. Yeah, it never occurred to me till that moment and possibly because we're taking this class. Mm -hmm. Right, because typically in a non-COVID world, if you just walk to the other side of the street, that would be a racist act. Of course, you know, in, in these right. same times, it's a different story, but... Um, that's you know I think that's a win though that you got that awareness. <laughs> I, I was I was 
actually kind of shocked is the best word I can think of that it even hit my consciousness. Mm. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's because I'm taking the class and reading all this, but I think it is. So thank you, Jessica. Time for our backpacks, you guys. Our unpacking our <laughs> knapsacks of, of privilege. So, of course, I knew we were about to do this. So I went ahead and I happened to have um, a backpack that I want to draw from. Now, for this to uh, be accessible to everybody, no matter what your drawing uh, skill level is, you can also draw from the images that I posted in the group. So if you're in the anti-racist art class group, you can click that um, unpacking the white privilege knapsack button. And it's just much easier for beginners to draw from a, um, a flat two-dimensional image that's already been drawn as opposed to a drawing, or as opposed to from life. Now I'm going can to- you get, Can you get Mighty Network on a desktop? I could only- oh, I yeah. Really? Oh, I've been doing it on my phone, which has made things a little weird. Complicated, yeah. Huh. Uh, you would go to school.jessicaantonelli.com. And if you want, we can um, play around with that at the end of class. Uh, but it's nice, because then you can get the big screen, of course. So they both have their pros and cons. Um, so I'm going to be kind of guiding through how I'm going to draw this. Uh, if y'all want to draw step by step along with me, let me just, I'm preparing my, my knapsack so it's a good still life backpack. Um, and I want to draw the, the backpack itself in, in pen, but before I do that, I'm going to start with a pencil just to get the proportions and the guidelines and everything in the right spot. So if you haven't already, you know, please do grab your art supplies. Um, we're gonna dive in. After we draw our knapsack, we'll actually start unpacking and listing out the privileges that we recognize that we hold um, around the knapsack. So this is our anti-racist art class for the day. Uh, the first thing that I always do when I begin any drawing is I start with the big shape, almost like the silhouette or the overall form before I dive in and do any of the details. So I'm just looking, I see that the top of my knapsack kind of angling downward, there's a curve, kind of sits a little um, wide at the base. I'm drawing lightly because I'm gonna go over this in pen. I don't want it to uh, show through too much, but I wanna be able to see it myself and then the base of the backpack has kind of a bunch of angles. I'm looking about halfway down the backpack is where the um, main flap sits. And I wanna just quickly sketch in the big, the big um, flap for the bottom bit. So this is just the overall shape of the backpack. I want to make sure, you know, does it fit on my page in a way where I'm not going to cut off the top of the bottom and will I have room or space on the sides to write out all the text that I want to write. So that's what I do. This happens to be a, just a red pencil. You could use a regular pencil and come back and um, erase it afterward if you want to get rid of your guideline marks. But I'm just making sure I know where my backpack going to sit on the page. If you're drawing from one of the images on the website, you would do the exact same thing. Look for the big shapes first, and then we're going to go in and do the details. And what's nice about drawing something like a, a knapsack instead of a person's face is you can mess it up. Don't worry about, you know, getting the pockets too big or the, you know, the straps in the wrong place because it's not like somebody's nose, you know, nobody's going to come back upset that you made them look funny. <laughs> So now um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to my pen. Pinterest actually has a how to draw a backpack. Perfect. Yeah, we'll have to put that in there as well. So now I'm going to commit with my pen lines. And this is where I'm going to start um, getting more detailed. So we'll start. 
And what I like about going in with pencil first is if there's something that I realize um, is off that I didn't like about the pencil drawing, you just kind of fix it as I go. So my initial lines were really angular. I'm going to make them a little bit more soft and organic. This happens to be like a le leather backpack. And I'm starting to add in the details. So for me, there's like a um, seam around the top of the backpack. I'm drawing that in now. There's a buckle. A lot of the times, one of the biggest tricks when, when drawing something as um, complicated as a backpack is just thinking about uh, what line needs to go first if, if items are overlapping. Does it matter um, for what we're going to do afterwards? Does it matter how many pockets or anything we have, or can we just do a simple one? Absolutely not. You can do a simple one. Um, I mean, you could even do a super simple purse and, and make it just, uh, you know, a, a big, <laughs> like, grocery bag um, or brown paper bag uh, kind of shape. It, the real thing here is thinking about unpacking our privilege. So that's probably one of the more complicated bits is the little. Um, that's complicated. Yeah. What do you call it? Hook, belt. The buckle? Buckle, thank you. So now I've just got the top flap. Ooh, I've got a really complicated um, handle at the top. But I'm starting with the loop. And I noticed that from the loop, there are two angles down from the top of it. And if I connect those, and then just draw the inner part of the loop like so. Looks nice and three-dimensional. Going pretty quickly through this. But of course, if you really want to um, draw the backpack amazingly, you can always tune back in and watch the replay. I'll be posting this in the group as well. And the outer, outer kind of blob of the backpack is much easier. And I'm going to simplify. I'm just my backpack's kind of complicated. So uh, this is something I think that's important in anything that you draw is editing. And I'm thinking of like Judith is a big lover of drawing architecture. And she's in New York City. And you can only imagine how many details there are and um, texture. <laughs> everything's so busy. But the thing that most artists do is they just edit. They don't draw every single little detail. That's what cameras are for. We're not here to be photographers or draw photorealistically. Um, so this is your artistic <laughs> interpretation. So I've got a lot of extra hooks and strings and buckles, and I am not going to draw any of them. I'm going to draw a super simplified version of this backpack. And even so, it still includes one more of these complicated buckles. So. Here I go again. Oh, you're really turning this into an art class. 
Well, I'm going to try. I thought it was all about the unpacking part, so I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's cool. I'm almost done, too. Um, and as soon as you are done, Judith, that'd be great if you want to get a head start by starting to write in or around, I should say, um, your backpack where you recognize that you hold privilege. So here we are. I don't. That's the problem. You don't <laughs> hold privilege? I don't recognize it. That's the problem. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> right. So how about I'll start going down the list. I mean, um, oh, man. Well, there was, first of all, you've got that story you just told us of yeah. growing up in a um, segregated community. So definitely I would put that in there. And it actually, uh, if you also want to go ahead and put some text. Now I'm cheating because my backpack doesn't technically have this strap here, but I think it just balances out the composition a little bit better have another strap down here. So here's my knapsack of, of privilege. Oh, Judith, the, I can't see because of the um, oh, I forgot. background thing. I'll get rid of it. Let me pop you up here. And if you want to use any kind of text, Oh, that's a good one. The invisible knapsack of white privilege. Nice work. Hey, looks like a backpack to me. So, oh, Zach, let me pop yours up here. Oh, oh look how good that, that is. Wow. Are you, what are you drawing on there? My iPad. <gasps> Ooh. That is really good. Can you save it? Oh, yeah, that's why I'm doing it, so I can save it and, uh, yes! Oh, my God, look, look at hers. That's fabulous. Oh, okay. Nicely done. I like all these uh, digital artists popping up here. That's so cute. <laughs> now I feel like I should redo it in more detail. You guys did great. Uh, like you said, it's, it's really about what we're unpacking from the backpack. Yeah, I know. Um, and so... If you look in the group as well, there are some resources on um, just little examples of some text that you can use so it looks maybe a little bit more artistic or thoughtful or something that you might want to share more than um, just coming in and like, <sighs> my handwriting is so bad. <laughs> now, if I think of my of handwriting or like, illustrating text. So if I want to write the knapsack of white privilege on here, the invisible knapsack of white privilege, I'm going to approach that as if I'm like drawing the letters in a certain way so they look a certain way because my handwriting mm -mm, is no good. But um, for now, I'm going to go ahead and start unpacking my backpack. So I'm going to draw some little lines going from the outside and the, the most screaming example of privilege that I've experienced, it's kind of, um, it's not a bright moment in my past, but a much younger Jessica, really stupid Jessica, Ellie, don't, don't ever do what I did, um, was, you know, not, not too far out of college, and I was driving from Houston back to Galveston, an hour-long drive after having a little bit of a party with my sister who lives in Houston. And um, I had had a few craft beers at my sister's house, which, you know, I was used to drinking the cheap beer, which has like very little alcohol in it. And these craft beers had like, it was like a glass of wine more than it was a beer. Um, so by the time I left the house and I thought I was good to drive to the hour later that I got to Galveston, I was not safe to drive at all. I was tipsy. It was um, a Mardi Gras weekend, and in Galveston, we have a big Mardi Gras celebration, so they had a zero-tolerance policy. If you even were supposed to be suspected at all of um, having any alcohol in your system, they wouldn't even breathalyze you. They were allowed to take you straight to jail, and so I'm 
blocks from my house. I was just less than a minute away from my home um, on the big road about to turn, turn off to my house. And I got pulled over because I was swerving. I was not okay to drive. Um, and I'm just in the car thinking to myself and my drunk brain, like, this is it. You know, you're about to get a DUI. <sighs> you really should have thought this through better, you know, okay. But like ready to take on the consequences of my actions. So the cop comes up, he says, do you know it's a zero tolerance week, uh, weekend, blah, blah, blah. Like, have you been drinking? And I told him yes. And that situation he goes and like is in his car writing things up and he comes back out and he says, so you live pretty close to here, right? Cause he'd see my address. I was like, I'm, I'm very close to my house. Yes, sir. Um, he says, I'm going to escort you home. So instead of giving me a ticket, giving me any, you know, repercussions to my actions, this cop actually drove me home, made sure that I walked into my door. All right. And that this little white girl was like taken care of by the police because you Is know, he white? Oh yeah. He was white. So what makes, I'm sorry, but I'm so bad. What makes you characterize that as white privilege? Do you assume if you weren't white that you would have been arrested? I don't think I would have been arrested. Um, I mean, I, I think I would have been taken to jail and I think it was also a female privilege um, and, you know, relatively attractive little, you know, I was a super cute little coming back from a party um, outfit. I don't think that the blind eye of justice should have allowed me to be escorted home that night. You know, I, if we live in this system where, you know, you, break the laws and like, sorry, but everybody gets treated the same. I should have, I should have been taken to jail. Like I was really not okay. I mean, I was drunk. I was drunk. I was drunk driving. And that guy, I mean, just the way that he was, his attitude toward me was very paternalistic, you know, very much like, okay, you know, he didn't go so far as to call me like honey or sweetie or anything, but um, I was benefiting from my, you know, outer shell of being a white woman. And I'm, you know, this is the thing about privilege, right? Like that was a big win for me in a weird way. Like, of course I didn't want to go to jail. Of course I didn't want to pay extra, extra fines. But when you've got people of color who are pulled over just because they're driving in the wrong neighborhood or just because that cop needs to get his quota of tickets for the night, you know, I just don't, think that that was normal. I think I was, I was being treated um, with a special, like, you know, kid glove, like, you know, little Southern bell kind of thing. Um, so I, I came home and, you know, it, it was, I, I walked to the door. I was, I was staying with my parents and my dad took one look at me and he was like, were you driving like that? Like I was obviously drunk. He, he was just, so like horrified and scared and sad just to see that his daughter was driving in such an unsafe way. And then I told him what happened and he, he like couldn't believe it. You know, it wasn't, there was something off happening about that situation. And yes, it was in my advantage, but that's privilege, right? That's like me being treated differently. So that's something I've always thought about. That was just really weird. And that's a big, huge one. That's not all the little things that I probably don't even know about, like being called on more by the teacher, things like that. But I'm rambling <laughs> now. Um, I'm going to write it down on my backpack. But I, I consider that like the most glaring privilege that I've experienced. Mm. I'm having trouble processing it do you think I deserved that um no but I don't recorded home um but I don't see it as privilege in the context of what we're discussing and maybe that's my problem I mean it is my problem hmm. can I chime in please Patty yeah I have heard uh, many stories like that for example, there is this girl in on YouTube that I follow. Uh, I don't know how I got into that channel. I really don't know, but but she, uh, yeah, she's a white 
very pretty girl who used to be a drug dealer <laughs> and she she was in jail she was actually in prison for three years and so she had she had a really messy and um, criminal background like really really bad and she has told stories like that like for example she, this is one that she told recently. I'll, I think I, I sent it to you, Jess, right? Yeah, because we talked about that exact story. Yeah, yeah. So not here, right? We didn't talk. No, no, no not in this class. Yeah. Heard it. yeah. So, so she was driving. Uh, she was not driving. She was on the passenger seat. And a black guy was driving. And the cops stopped them. And he was immediately, he was uh, scared, he was afraid. So he told her like, please switch with me. And she was like, what? Like, how? Like, because they were driving, like they were on the road. So, okay, so they switched. I don't know how they did it. And the cops stopped them. And the cops, and she was still a drug dealer by, by that time. So she had drugs on her. She was like... She was actually, she was supposed to be in New York. Yeah, she was breaking her parole. Yeah, she was breaking her parole. So she knew that if they checked her name, she was going to go to jail. Like, that was it. There was no other way around it. But she was very, very pretty, white. And so they stopped them. And they went after the black guy who was not driving by, by that time. So they told him to get out of the car. And I don't know what was, do you remember why did they take him? Um, it was because he had an expired like parking ticket or like a really oh, yeah, old yeah. thing in his system, in the system. Yeah, and they arrested him. And they didn't even ask anything uh, of her. Like they were like, also like very paternal and she, she she tells that, that they were very like, okay, so go home, uh, be safe, you know? And she was just in shock because her friend, who was not a drug dealer, who was like, he had nothing else but a parking ticket, expired, whatever. Um, he was taken to jail while she was just like, oh yeah, sweetie, go home. And... So that is one, for example, I don't know if you guys have seen a documentary on Netflix uh, of Chelsea Handler. Mm. I mean, I don't love her, but, <laughs> but the documentary is interesting because it's about white privilege. And she talks about stories like that, also like uh, Jessica's story, that she didn't recognize at the time that it was because of her white privilege, because she says that exactly like what happened to you to you Jess that that happened to her many times and she was always escorted back home and and just like very like sheltered and protected and treated nicely while her black friends because she was living with a boyfriend in a black neighborhood and her black friends were always taken to jail mm -hmm. like in the same circumstances like exactly same circumstances. And she says now that back then she didn't know, like she had no idea that that was a privilege of her color. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree that that is a white privilege. Yeah, and I think the overall generalization that I could make would be when I think of the cops, um, I've never really had to call the cops for anything, but I would know that they're going to be looking out for me, that they're on my side. It's, it's very much like the whole Chris Cooper, Amy Cooper thing that happened in Central Park with the bird watcher um, situation and the dogs, you know. That woman knew that she could call the cops and just by calling out her race um, as a white woman that the police would be on her side regardless of the situation. I, you know, I did not fear for anything whenever I was being pulled over I was like I feared for the consequences that I, I should have naturally been given and then I didn't even have to deal with those I was it was an exception that was made for me and um 
but I'm glad that we're we're diving into that and that yeah, Judith. Yeah. I'm really upset. Don't worry. I'm really upset because I can't. Other than the story about growing up in that environment, I cannot right now conjure up any examples like that. I just not that they didn't happen. I'm sure they did. I just can't. Judith, Judith don't feel bad. I mean, this is a growing process, you know? Like, we're... I'm really upset. It's okay. And that's okay. And that's okay. And, you know, the whole... Um, this is why this work is so important, because things have been set up so that we don't have to ever have these hard reflections. And I probably have dozens of like little micro moments where I've experienced privilege that I'm not aware of, that one was just so glaring. Like that was one where I was like, there's something off here. And it, you know, hopefully not, you're there's a more responsible citizen who's not going around driving drunk and, you know, having the, the Southern police like <laughs> take you home. Um, you're also in a much more diverse uh, city. So, you know, your experiences are gonna be very different than my experience. And you have shared with us already some of the anti-Semitism that you've experienced that was more clear to you. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it is, it's becoming something in your awareness, just like you mentioned going on your walk, you know, you're starting to notice um, behaviors and, and patterns that you didn't notice before. So this is why we're here doing this. So thank you for sharing that. Any other um, thoughts, reactions, memories? Zach? Um, I just realized that um, being raised in an environment where the way I speak, my grammar and vocabulary and cadence, it mm -hmm. reinforces my privilege. Um, they're not, I would imagine that there are, how do I say, people who speak with particular dialects that are, um, how do I say, thought of as lesser than, mm -hmm. um, because the people um, in a certain, I don't know, robe or uniform, uh, they don't identify with a certain cultural um, way of speaking, dialect, whatever you call it. Um, so I was raised in, I, was, I, I went to school in Washington, DC, very strict grammar um, upbringing, and like, I think that's definitely benefited me. I know I've gotten jobs on account of my ability to speak to people, um, on my ability to, um, I don't know, just to articulate. Yeah. And I know that's a huge privilege. Um, I know that there are, um, that, that's, a, that's a thing I've, I, I well, and. And so now they've defined um, Ebonics as its own actual language, which does have its own grammar and they have acknowledged that people who speak Ebonics and speak English, like the way that we're speaking it right now, are those people are bilingual. And what that, that is referred to in the black community is code switching. There's actually a, a podcast called Code Switch that really dives into race and race relations. Um, but for uh, black people in America, they're often asked to code switch in order to make the people, the white people around them feel more comfortable or not think down on them because of, of the way that, that they're speaking. Um, and that's called yeah. Ebonics? E Ebonics. E the letter E-B-O-N-I-C-S? Oh, I've never heard the term. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ebonics. I haven't either. Really? I mean, I certainly should. I've heard the language, but not the name for it. Yeah. I've experienced a little bit of code switching, um, teaching in uh, very diverse schools. Um, I would code switch because I, I went to school in a, where I was a minority. There were, there were fewer white kids than um, black and Hispanic kids. And so I heard it so often, you know, you pick some things up and, and in order to connect with people, you just, you want to reflect back. Like we like to see reflections of ourselves and feel like comfortable and uh, even just interpersonal communications like at work. I remember one of the best pieces of advice that my aunt ever gave me was people 
like talking to people who talk like they do. And she had this really tough client who would come in and he would be very direct and bossy. And, you know, this was nothing to do with race. He was just, everybody thought he was an asshole. Excuse me. <laughs> but, you know. Um, That's a technical term. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, instead of, you know, trying to be her normal polite self, just started talking back to him like, sir, I did this and if you're going to want to go on this trip, you have to do this. There is no exception. This passport needs to be triple checked or else you are not going on your trip. Blah, 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 blah. And she was just reflected right back to him the way that he spoke to her. And he became her, she just had him wrapped around her finger. He, she was the only travel agent he wanted to work with. And she said, you know, that's how uh, you, what is it? Uh, make friends and influence people. That's one of those things that you do. And so um, code switching is one of the privileges that we have is, is to not even know about it, say, because we don't have to code switch to get by in the majority, um, you know, white speaking um, workplace. And also in, in the school, in schools, we our schools cater to middle class values, middle class um, language. Uh, like Zach said, you know, in an interview, you're going to be expected to speak a certain way. Um, so that's a whole, yeah, that's another big conversation right there. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, you're absolutely welcome. I have to run because I have to go teach, um, but it was, this is a, an amazing class. I'm really, really glad to be part of it. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Hey, Zach, thanks for coming. Any other reflections as we're kind of wrapping things up today? I, I you know, I, I think, I mean, I wrote a couple things down, but I didn't want to just duplicate you know, writing 50 things down that this other woman wrote down that I could probably nod to probably pretty close to all of them. But I wondered if I could take a minute to to draw something that came out of my work during this week. It's not exactly white privilege. Go for it. Thank you, Car Carol. Okay. So one of the things, of course, that all of us have been seeing is this image of... Um, George Floyd with the police on his neck. But when I was watching the um, movie this week, um, I Am Not Your Negro, the James Baldwin movie, there was a photograph, it, it went by, it wasn't the main focus of the movie, but it, uh, the scenes from Birmingham, and it showed, and I've just done a quick sketch of it, and I put James Baldwin's words next to it, And these are three white policemen with their knee on the neck of this black woman who actually has a name, Ethel Witherspoon. And the James Baldwin words are, you cannot fix what you will not face. It gives me chills. This yeah. photograph was not put on the front page of newspapers or magazines. It was, it, it's in the archives, but the woman who, um, had so I, I went and I found the still image of this from out of the movie and the woman who has a book about images from the civil rights movement said this image was not published and so I then took this picture of the officer with his knee this painful painful picture on George Floyd's neck with the same words Next to it, you cannot fix what you will not face. And wrote underneath it, my words, we face this cruel death. What can we fix? So that was my effort at, you know, poster art in a sense. I guess it needs a... Anyway, I wanted to... No, thank you for, for sharing that. Those are such hard, hard... Um images to even to look at and and it's it's uh, that's something we're going to talk about if not in the next class then soon um white fragility uh which is our hes hesitancy to face this this ugly ugly thing and to even acknowledge it there's so many people who deny racism is a problem and um i, I know we've all been going through a lot of feelings uh, just in this call, like reacting to what we're, we're seeing and talking about and unpacking from our white privilege backpack. Um, 
And yeah, it's a privilege to not have to think about that and be, you know, in dialogue with it in your mind every single day as you go around your, your day-to-day life. I'm going to pop up on the screen real quick. Um, this anti-racist graphic. Um, I was really heartbroken to talk to a friend of mine. I think I mentioned her to y'all in an earlier call. Um, she's someone who actually, I got to get her in on these, on these calls. Uh, she's very down for the anti-racist journey, uh, but her husband is a, a Trump supporter and he's here in the fear zone. He completely denies that racism is a problem. He thinks that everything that is going on right now Um, with this kind of uprising of a new civil rights movement is a conspiracy to uh, distract people from the elections coming up. And I'll talk about avoiding hard questions, striving to be comfortable. These are uncomfortable conversations. Um, And, you know, uh, only he's in a bubble. Even if he tried, I don't know if he would be able to find a person of color to interact with. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all the fear zone, you know, and it's, it's so directly connected to that quote you just shared, Carol. Um, if we refuse to talk about this stuff, uh, to have these hard conversations, look at these hard questions to have these, these, these reflections, then we're never going to learn and grow and speak out, um, eventually. So we're kind of here, we're in the learning zone, you know, we're recognizing racism is a problem, a current problem. This isn't something from the 1960s. We are here have, having conversations that make us uncomfortable. Um, we are working to understand our privilege uh, in the past of that ignoring it or not even knowing that it existed, uh, that racism is a problem. We're trying to educate ourselves about structural racism and race We're being very vulnerable. Thank you guys for for opening up here um, about our biases and knowledge gaps. And we are listening to others who are look differently than us. And you know what, if you're in a, if you're in a place where you don't even see a person of color, like in your entire state (laughs) um, or city, we've got the internet y'all, you know, uh, like, Judith was uh, watching that video interviewing Ibram X. Kindi. There are so many people that you can follow on YouTube. There are authors we can read. There are movies we can watch. There are books we can, we can read. Um, being open to getting more color in your, uh, in your day-to-day influences doesn't have to mean you go out and find a black friend. And there's, that's a complicated issue too. Eventually we're going to get around to talking about tokenism. You know, if you're going out and finding a black friend just for the sake of having a black friend, that's, that's not necessarily what you want to do. Especially, you know, as you can tell, these are heavy conversations. This is what's called emotional labor. It might be a term that you hear more often um, in, in context with these conversations, because to hold someone else's pain and discomfort in having some of these conversations, it, it does um, take emotional uh, work, you know, to, to be able to really empathize and listen and to, to hear someone uh, go through something. And that's why we're here having this conversation amongst ourselves and not in a more div- diverse group because people of color, black people especially, they already know and they are probably not in a situation where they want to um sit with us through this you know they've got their own issues and their own people to take care of so um that's growth zone over here right so i sit with my discomfort and cheers to y'all because y'all that's what we're doing here um we're identifying how we may unknowingly benefit from racism that's you know if you go ahead and read the rest of the uh essay that we looked at today that's going to help give you even more more insight into that um and eventually you know that this these kinds of conversations and this type of work and and research is going to give us the confidence to speak out when we see racism in action to know yes that is racism i'm seeing something racist happening that phrase that thought pattern that we never thought of as racist before now we can maybe say something